All right, now I would like to talk a bit about some of the small pieces that attach to an article and some of the um, details that go into them. The first is the abstract. This should be written after you've done the article. Uh, the obvious reason is that while you're writing the article, you'll have certain, developed a certain point of view, made certain points, and these should be the ones emphasized in the abstract. I've heard of some people saying you should write the abstract first to give your sense of st some structure to the article, but this doesn't make sense to me. Note from the guidelines of the journal how the abstract is to be set out. They'll usually have it structured and they'll have specific headings. Please use the exact headings that the journal mentions. It's very important. They will make you change it if you don't. Also be very careful about the word count. If they say 250 words, if you have 251, you will not be able to submit the abstract. So be very careful with your word count. The abstract should reflect the study findings fairly. I've seen a few where they made much more of the article in the abstract than was actually justified by the article itself. So be careful with this. But on the other hand, you are marketing your article in the abstract. Don't forget that most people only read this, sadly but true. Uh, so if you're going to make some certain points, make them in the abstract as clearly as possible. Use your words very sparingly and have someone else read it who's never seen your article before to see if they have captured the essence of the article. The next section is on the title. Remember that this is the, your first chance to catch readers' interests. There's great competition for their interest from many different points of view and this is your only chance to really stop them to have a look at your article. Be as specific as you can in the title. Uh, something that's very general will just slide over their interests very quickly. So including the specifics about where it's located, um, how things are actually happening in the article is, is definitely important. If you've got a specific design in mind, like a randomized control trial or a qualitative study, include that in the title because it does um, bring out some, some areas of interest for some people. Go back to the journal that you're going to be submitting to and look at how they do titles. They may have a certain style, even if they don't mention it in the guidelines. Some have a two-sentence type of uh, title. Some ask a question. Um, but whenever you're doing, try to find something in your subject that you can put in the title that is the, what we call the hook in marketing. Something that will stop a reader in their tracks so that they'll think, hmm, that's interesting. I maybe want to stop and read more about it. Moving on to the title page. This will be used when you submit the article to the journal. It's not part of the actual article itself. But the title page is important. It includes the actual article title. It'll then include a list of, art of the authors. And for each author, there'll have to be a section on attribution. This can be done in different ways. And again, look at the journal that you're going to be submitting to as to their style. Often you'll have a list of authors with numbers one, two, and three after them. And, and somewhat below it, you'll have the list of their particular attributions one, two, and three. Other, other journals do it different ways. But check on your own journal to see which, which is the most appropriate. The order of authors is uh, often not entirely clear, but I can tell you that the first author does most of the work and gets most of the glory and should be listed first. Second author does quite a lot of work and is, uh, gets some of the glory. The rest of the authors really do some of the work, but don't share much of the glory. The last position in the authorship list is not a formal position, but often if a group of uh, authors have a more senior mentor, they put that person's name at the end. But this is just a convention, it's not a rule, and usually the author guidelines do not say anything about author order. You should also mention separately who the corresponding author is. Normally it's the first author, but in an organization like MSF, 
where people are traveling and are moving around a lot, you may assign the corresponding officer to be the second or third author so that that person is in one place and can actually be corresponded with. The corresponding author will handle all the correspondence, obviously, with the journal, back and forth with the reviews and so on. So it's very important that their, their location be specified. The journal will also probably ask for some keywords, such as HIV, TB, um, operational research, and they may ask for a short running title that will go at the bottom of each page of the article when it's submitted. It's also worthwhile putting on the title page the word count to show that you are actually within the word counts specified by the guidelines, and you can put word count for both the main article and the guidelines, and the abstract. I'd now like to talk about references. This is a sticky point in the publication business, and you'll have to be very careful with it. When you're citing references, only recite the relevant ones that actually support the points you make in your study. And be sure you've read them to make sure you understand the individual nuances of the article. Just citing a, an article having read the abstract is really not fair. Check a journal's style for references. Many of them will say they're Vancouver style, for instance, and there are many different styles. But within Vancouver style, we've seen a number of journals change them subtly, changing with um, things like punctuation, um, using bold and italics, so that although it's, quote, Vancouver style, unquote, in fact, there are slight modifications for that particular journal that you need to pay attention to. There are programs that can change a reference's style based on the journal, but you're still going to have to go through and do it manually to make sure you've crossed every T and dotted every I. Please keep a copy of all your references because when they come back to the copy editing stage and you have 48 hours to return the article, they'll ask you to check reference number five to make sure you've got all the punctuation correct. You'll need to have the article uh, handy. Acknowledgements. Uh, in this section, you will acknowledge contributors to the article who are not authors, and I'll explain who's an author later on. You need permission to include somebody who's going to be acknowledged um, because it's not fair just to say uh, we acknowledge so-and-so unless you've had their permission and they, in case they had nothing to do with the article in, in the first place. Getting permission to do or to use sections of another article that you've copied directly, i.e. a figure or table, is very important to get from the publisher. You'll have to, you'll have to show that you've done that. There will next be a section on funding and competing interests. It's pretty obvious that if you've been funded by somebody, you need to spell that out. This is mostly important in studies that are looking at new drugs and are supported by drug companies. Uh, and for operation research, it's usually pretty minimal. The next section is on authorship, and um, I'll have to explain this in some detail. About 15 years ago, a group of the, auth of the editors for the big journals uh, known as the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, got together and decided they needed to upgrade the definition of an author. In the past, uh, there had been a lot of uh, craziness going on in authorship. You'd have people who had nothing to do with an article but were a senior person in a lab putting their name first. In other cases, in other cases, there, uh, companies would hire ghost writers who would write the article and then they'd approach a big wig in the field to put their name on the article. This was seen as basically extremely unfair, so that the editors moved to a more comprehensive definition where people were responsible for their, their, their contributions towards the article itself. So, most peer-reviewed journals have a section on authorship where they say, we follow the the definition of the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, as is written here. An author is someone who has made a substantial contribution to the conception and design, or acquisition of data, or analysis and interpretation of data. Note that it doesn't say you have to do all of those, just any one of the three. Secondly, you have to be either drafting the article or critically reviewing it. 
And finally, you have to be willing to sign off on the final version to be published. To be an author, you must meet all three conditions. Now, in many cases in operation research, to do the research, you have to involve somebody who's uh, running a program or somebody involved at the ministerial level. To change policy and practice, you need to engage those people and they need to be part of the process of framing the article. So we've actually written an editorial, our group in the MSF and the TB Union, where we've said that an author should also include program directors or policy managers who are engaged in the first section of the authorship. They contribute to the conception and design of the article and that they critically review it. We feel this is extremely important because if they're not engaged in this way, the chances of the findings being used in changing policy is minimized. But this is very important that they be included. When you're talking about authorship, discuss it early in the, in the study's history. If a group of you have done some data collection in a certain area, you may decide, for instance, to do two or three articles, and you can divide up who's going to be first author. Note that the first author gets most of the glory, but does most of the work. Um, this may be important if you're in an academic institution, but less so in operational research. I mentioned already the corresponding authorship, author issue, but most journals require an explicit description of who did what within the article. For instance, some person could be doing statistics, someone involved with data collection, uh, someone else involved with just the conception and design. Uh, note that, however, that you have to be explicit about who did what in this section. And I think many journals will question whether more than 10 to 12 people could really significantly contribute to an article. Although I have seen articles with 20 and 30 authors, I really doubt whether they fulfilled the criteria.